Assalamu alaikum. Today we will begin with a lecture 6 and I am going to look at the second poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge with you. Uh, but before I start with the analysis of uh, this poem, I am just going to give you a brief recap of what we did in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we looked at uh, Coleridge's uh, shorter poem uh, with the title Kubla Khan. And I explained to you how uh, Coleridge likes to blend the natural and the supernatural phenomena. He is different from Wordsworth because he likes to employ uh, supernatural phenomena in his poetry. He uh, wants to bring in images of strange kind in his poetry. In fact, this is where he and Wordsworth uh, are different from each other. Wordsworth only sees one aspect of nature. He sees only the external beauties in nature and how those beauties can bring about change in mankind, in the individual, in the human being. And his is a very subjective and a personal relationship with nature. But Coleridge, on the other hand, we see, though they were both partners, but Coleridge uh, chooses the, uh, the world of, uh, of the strange phenomena. He chooses uh, a world which is filled with uh, ghost ships, which has uh, uh, strange characters, which has got strange birds, uh, which has got, uh, he speaks of uh, spirits, he speaks of uh, strange visions, he talks about strange dreams. So, just like in Kubla Khan, we see that he creates for us a picture of a world which is beautiful, yet at the same time, uh, which is strange, which is uh, strange in the sense that it is destructive as well as uh, uh, beautiful. So, it's, it's, it is as if Coleridge cannot decide whether uh, the nature uh, that he portrays in Kubla Khan, uh, it, uh, it is peaceful, it is soothing, or it is uh, of the beneficent kind, or is it the dest uh, destructive, uh, the harmful. So, he is he, he cannot balance between the two. This is why we see uh, he, he offers us, uh, he offers so much contrast in the poem. We see that he's con he uses contrasting images throughout the poem. He talks about uh, the river, uh, the fountain of life, and then he talks about the ocean, which is sunless. S he talks about uh, the flowing rivers and the bright landscape, and then he talks about uh, the measureless caves, uh, and then he talks about the uh, the sunless sea. Then he talks about uh, the pleasure dome, and at the same time he's talking about the uh, ice caves. So he is constantly contrasting, uh, using contrast. He's constantly using contrasting images, and. This is how what, uh, Coleridge appeals to us. This is why he appeals to us, because uh, uh, he is a master of these strange phenomena. He employs them beautifully. His language also is suitable uh, for the images that he is creating for us. The uh, language also becomes archaic as he is talking about things uh, which used to happen in the past, things which were uh, uh, which had more powerful power, which had more impact uh, uh, in, uh, in the past. So he's also using language which is compatible with those, with that imagery, with those descriptions. So today we're going to look at his uh, longer piece, uh, the poem called The Rhyme of Ancient Mariner, and you will see that he is uh, going to use supernatural in the same similar fashion uh, as he used in Kubla Khan. The poem, this poem is also uh, filled, uh, is full of supernatural imagery and you, we will constantly find uh, Coleridge uh, trying to reconcile the supernatural with the natural imagery. He's going to, uh, n you will find him not separating the two 
and you will see that he is he does not separate the supernatural with the natural world he makes the supernatural as part of the natural world and this is uh, his beauty as normal individuals also we tend to separate the supernatural world uh, we as human beings live in a world uh, uh, which is which is natural for us which is uh, uh, which we interpret through our senses so uh, that that is a natural world around us which we see which we can experience which we can feel which we can respond to and uh, the supernatural world is totally different from us it is apart from us it we don't uh, even when we talk about it we don't talk about it as if we are part of that world it is that world it is the other world it is not our world so when you talk about ghosts when you talk about spirits we talk about dead bodies when we talk about um, the strange uh, phenomena of magic uh, um, of uh, of ghosts of spirits we talk as if it is another world so but we, we, you will see that with Coleridge these two worlds are not two separate worlds he does not comp compartmentalize them he does not put them into separate boxes he combines the two and uh, this is the beauty of this poem also the rhyme of the ancient mariner that uh, he offers you a blend uh, he blends in fact the supernatural and the natural world and he blends them so beautifully that it is difficult to separate the uh, the supernatural uh, occurrences from the natural occurrences he will show you how uh, the natural world as well as the supernatural world how they act upon individual but it will be difficult for you to decide uh, to separate the natural from the supernatural he makes them into one and this is why his poems are powerful this is why his use of supernatural machinery is possible is powerful because uh, we f uh, we feel that it is part of our own world we don't feel at any moment that it is some other world uh, some external world that is acting upon us but we feel that it is the same world which is acting upon us so the title of the poem says that it is the rhyme of the ancient mariner the rhyme so it is the poem it is a song it is a rhyme of he says the ancient mariner in the very title itself he tells you what it is about he tells you that the poem will be about the ancient mariner and the word that he uses for you is ancient ancient refers to uh, something very old something uh, very old-fashioned something that uh, uh, is not new something that's not modern so ancient far back in the time so and mariner he is a sailor he has spent most of his uh, it's about a person who spent most of his lifetime uh, on ship so but Coleridge calls him the ancient mariner with a purpose he calls him the ancient mariner to give us the impression that this person this mariner has been there for a long time it is as if he is immortal he's ancient he has been uh, living for a long long time now and uh, so he's a very very old fellow uh, so that is why he calls him the ancient mariner and you will see he's also uh, he will also take us back in history because this ancient mariner is telling us his tale he is telling us his story he's telling us of an incident that happened to him when maybe he was an adult he was a young adult so it is his story it is his rhyme and he has lived this long to tell his tale to tell his story so the title is significant it is significant because you will see that Coleridge will use this title you will use this uh, word for this mari mariner the ancient he will keep calling him the ancient 
throughout the poem and it is significant so uh, the rhyme of the ancient mariner the text that I have taken and I'm sure you have a similar text is uh, which was printed in 1834 and you will see that uh, most of the words that Coleridge uses and the language that he employs in the poem it's also archaic it is old language it is old-fashioned language most of the words are not even used nowadays but it has also got to do with the uh, with the sailors with the language of that the sailors speak sailors are not educated individuals they uh, they ha have less to do with uh, the normal uh, life uh, of uh, normal people they do not uh, uh, mingle in the normal world a lot they spend most of the time out in the oceans and the seas and uh, that is why uh, uh, their language is also uncouth, uncivilized and it is not as sophisticated as uh, an educated man's language you will see that Coleridge uses language that is old-fashioned uh, because one reason is because he's talk taking us back in time he's talking about uh, the past he's talking about the history but another reason may be that he's talking about it is a sailor who is describing his story he is telling his tale so uh, he is going to do it uh, with the kind of language that he knows with the kind of vocabulary that he has uh, so this the reason it is a long poem is because it is a story and you will see that it is uh, developed in a narrative style so the poem is a narrative it is it is a narration he's narrating a story he's telling us a story uh, so uh, he is work so Coleridge employs or uses a narrative method and, and the method which is used in storytelling in this poem so it moves like a prose and it is written most of it is also written in iambic pentameter the setting is it's not clear but you uh, it we, we can suppose that it is around hundred years old uh, he's taking us maybe a century back and it is about this ancient mariner and his uh, crew the rest of the shalers on the ship and uh, there are 201 in number and uh, the ancient mariner is going to tell you what happened to him and what happened to his crew uh, when they uh, went on a journey on this ship and uh, how was it that out of this crew of 200 men only one survived and that was the ancient mariner to tell his tale so before we begin with the poem you should keep this in mind uh, the story uh, involves the ancient mariner and his 201 crew members but none of them is able to return safely is able to return alive except the ancient mariner a lot happens uh, to them during their journey and the journey is full of fear horror suspense and, um, and another significant aspect of this poem is that it also has a moral lesson Coleridge uh, maybe with an intention has intended to give us a moral lesson through this poem there was no moral lesson in Kubla Khan but here he has given you a, a moral towards the end so uh, the story uh, has a meaning it has a message and it is to tell that message it is to exp uh, express this message it is to spread this message that this ancient mariner has been allowed to live actually the others died he could also have died but he's been allowed to live and he is living up till now because 
his fate is to keep on telling his story. So he keeps on telling the story to, uh, to individuals as he meets them. And um, the reason being that uh, he, uh, he wants others to learn from his mistakes. So, so very clearly this poem has a message and Coleridge uses Ancient Mariner uh, to convey that message repeatedly because the Ancient Mariner keeps conveying the message to different people as he comes across them. Uh, another significant thing about the poem is that you will find that Coleridge takes you to strange places. He's going to take you to the Arctic, the Antarctic. He takes us to, those, to the land of ice. He talks about the geographical division of our Earth. He talks, does not talk about the latitudes, but he does talk about the equator, which is the center, uh, which is at the center of the Earth. So uh, uh, you, he will also, uh, he's also going to use different themes in his poems. All of this I am discussing with you generally to give you an idea uh, what to expect in the poem. But uh, after I'm done with the analysis of the poem, I am going to look at all these features with you in detail. So one after the other, uh, but this brief introduction was only meant to give to, uh, to give you an idea of what to expect in this poem and uh, so you will see that Coleridge uses also uses a lot of pictorial images he uses a lot of pictorial images he is uh, he creates uh, beautiful images and pictures for you uh, remember I told you about his own description of the primary and the secondary imagination and I hope you also remember that Coleridge explained that the primary imagination is the imagination that we all have it is the imagination that is universal it is the imagination that is common to all individuals you have it I have it all of us have the primary imagination because the primary imagination is uh, received through, created through our senses, eyes, ears, you know, all of our senses. So that is the primary imagination. But he says the poets, the special individuals, the special people amongst us, they, apart from um, the primary imagination, they also have the secondary imagination. But I, maybe, or you maybe, if we are not special, we do not have that secondary imagination. That secondary imagination is the imagination of the artists, it is the imagination of the poets, and they only have it. And this is secondary imagination is what he calls the synthesizing power, what he calls the creative power. And it is when the poet uses his secondary imagination, he uses his secondary imagination to create for us beautiful images, to synthesize the contradictions, to synthesize images and to give us a beautiful piece. So we will see a lot of that in this poem. We will see Coleridge employing his secondary imagination beautifully and we will see the role of secondary imagination uh, in this poem also just as we saw it in his other poem, the Qubla Khan. So, uh, the poem, uh, The Ancient Mariner, is divided into different parts. I am going to do uh, each part with you uh, separately in a separate lecture. And uh, today we are going to start with part one. The part one of The Ancient Mariner introduces to you uh, the story naturally you will see that uh, Coleridge is going to go in the chronological order he's going to build up the story to a point uh, to the climax as we call it so he's going to take you build it up take you to the climax and then back to the normal 
Before part one uh, is appendix the argument and Coleridge tells us and I will read these few lines for you he tells us how a ship having passed the line now this this word the line is important wherever it occurs it means the equator the line is the equator and the equator is uh, I, I'm sure you all know it is the line that runs through the center of the earth it divides uh, the earth uh, into two poles and it, so this is a line you will see that Coleridge uses uh, the line or the equator in a very significant manner it is the at the equator that you the ch any change or a development in the plot will occur whenever the ship will come across or reach the equator there will be a change there will be a change or a development in the plot so it says how a ship having passed the line was driven by storms to the coal country towards the south pole and how from thence she made her course to the tropical latitude of the great pacific ocean and of the strange things that we feel and in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country so these few sentences give you the summary of the whole poem summary how what happens in the first part is how a ship having passed the line so she tells us how the ship first goes past the equator it passes the line passes the equator and is driven by storms and the storms these winds and storms they push it towards the cold country which is the south pole and then he says how from thence she made her course to the tropical latitude and once first she went downwards towards the south pole then she came back towards as uh, Coleridge tells us the great Pacific Ocean and of the strange things that befell and then in that d during that journey journey towards the South Pole and back from the South Pole to the Pacific what befell it what happened to it and in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country and then it tells us ke how he returned from the Pacific Ocean he returned to his own country so this is just the argument gives you a brief summary of the poem let's begin with the analysis part one it is an ancient mariner and he stoppeth one of three by thy long gray beard and glittering eye now wherefore stoppest thou me so in the beginning of the story what happens you see I told you Coleridge is going to use this word ancient every time he mentions the mariner he's going to use this word with the mariner in a uh, number of times in the poem he says that the mariner was waiting outside a wedding and he sees two wedding guests trying to enter the wedding and when he sees the three of them he tries to stop one of them he stops one of the three wedding guests who was who were going to the wedding and the last two lines these are said by the wedding guest he says by thy long gray beard and glittering eye I have highlighted these words for you because they are significant they give you a description of the ancient mariner he has a he's got a long gray beard and he's got glittering sh meaning shining eyes shining eyes you must remember this because words Coleridge is going to use this expression glittering eye a lot also and you must not forget that this man is old he's got a long gray beard so he has got that ancient look about him but do old men have glittering eye do, do, do they have shiny shining eyes no so this ancient mariner is special 
and strange. This is why he's strange, because he looks ancient, he looks strange, he looks old, but he's got glittering eyes. There is a reason for this. I want you to keep this in mind, and uh, when uh, there is, uh, when we come to an at an appropriate place, I'm going to explain to you why. Now, wherefore stoppest thou me? So the wedding guest asks him, why are you stopping me from going to the wedding? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayest hear the merry din. This is still the bridegroom, uh, the wedding guest, sorry, this is still the wedding guest speaking. He says that the doors to the wedding are open, and I am a relative of the bridegroom. So, and all the guests are assembled. Guests are met means the guests are assembled. They have gathered uh, for the wedding. The food is about to begin. And I can hear the music, the merry. Merry means happy. And I can hear the merry din, the merry music of the wedding. So, the wedding guest is keen to join the wedding. He wants to be part of the wedding. But he is not to attend that wedding because as Coleridge tells us next, he holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, Kothi. Hold off, unhand me, grave beard loom. If stones his hand dropped he. So a lot of things happening here. Further description of the ancient mariner is given to you. His skinny hands are mentioned. So the ancient mariner grips the wedding guest with his skinny hands. Now he's gray beard, he's got glittering eyes, but he's also got skinny hands. So he looks really strange. Maybe the wedding guest is afraid of him. And what, when the ancient mariner holds him by the arm, he also whispers, there was a ship. Now, if someone is to do this to you, naturally you will be scared. Now, without any introduction, the ancient mariner stops someone and begins his tale, begins his story. Right away he says, there was a ship. He doesn't introduce himself. He doesn't tell who he is. He doesn't say why he wants to tell his story. He just begins. So you see how uh, uh, Coleridge is develop, devel, uh, developing his uh, bring uh, developing his supernatural, this strange and supernatural aura. Hold off. So he is the wedding guest is actually frightened. He says, "Leave me, unhand me, take your hand off me, grey beard loon." So he calls him a you know loon is a uh, a foolish a madman. He calls, he thinks he's mad, he thinks he's a mad person. So he asks him to stay away. It, if stones, if, if stones means suddenly, immediately. So immediately the ancient mariner dropped his hand. The ancient mariner drops his hand. He was holding the wedding guest. He, but, and, but when the wedding guest was frightened, he drops his hand. But he does not drop his gaze. He does not drop his eyes. He keeps looking at the wedding guest with his glittering eyes. And the result is, as Coleridge tells us, he holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. Do you see what has happened? The mariner could not hold him with his arm, with his hand, but he could hold him with his eyes, the glittering eyes. His eyes seem to hypnotize. His eyes seem to mesmerize the wedding guest. Coleridge may not have been familiar with the word hypnotize, but we are now. We know the, of the power of the hypnotism. We know that it is done uh, through constantly looking into another person's eye. Maybe this is what the mariner has done to the wedding guest. He has been able to hypnotize the wedding guest. But this is also because 
the mariner had some power in him he did he was old but there was something there was some strange power in him so the wedding guest stood still stood still he could not move and then Coleridge tells us he listens like a three years child so he is now ready even to stop he was so keen to go to the wedding but now he stops and looks up to the wedding uh, looks up to the ancient mariner to tell him a story to tell him a tale like a small child so eager so keen to listen to a story now the wedding guest is also keen to listen to the mariner's story the mariner hath his way the wedding guest sat on a stone he cannot choose but hear and thus peak on that ancient mariner and thus peak on that ancient man the bright eyed mariner so what is the effect of the wedding guest uh, what is the effect on the wedding guest of the mariner's glare is that he now sits down outside uh, the wedding hall on a stone and he is ready to listen to the mariner's tale and the mariner or the ancient man as Coleridge tells us the bright eyed mariner he begins his story and let's now start with his story he says the ship was cheered the harbor cleared merrily did we drop below the kirk below the hill below the lighthouse top he presents to you the scene when the ship is leaving the harbor the ship docks at the harbor it stops at the harbor uh, then all uh, it gets loaded with things then all the crew members uh, go back onto their ship and then the ship is ready to leave the harbor that is a time of joy everybody standing on the dock on the uh, the uh, harbor cheers them waves uh, the shipmates uh, and say goodbye to them so it is a f moment uh, of merriment for them this is what coleridge is describing to you the ship was cheered the harbor cleared merrily did we drop so they were all happy they all started their journey in a happy mood below the kirk they went past the church past the hill and below the lighthouse top so they passed all the areas uh, which was uh, near to land Coleridge then tells you that the sun came up upon the left out of the sea came he and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea first important thing here is to notice the movement of the sun Coleridge does not tell you the direction in which they are going he doesn't tell you where they're moving he only tells you through nature so you see how he's combining the natural and the supernatural phenomena before this point he was describing to you the supernatural effect of the ancient mariner on the wedding guests guest how strange it all was the strange power the strange supernatural power of the ancient mariner to hold off the wedding guest to force him uh, to subdue him to tell his story and now he takes the help of nature the natural world to tell you where where they are going what is their direction and he says the sun came up upon the left the they as the uh, their movement their direction is told to you from this uh, uh, movement of the sun he says the sun when it came up it came up in the on their left and naturally it went down on their right so if the east is on your left and the west is on your right naturally you are moving towards south so they are going towards south the ship is moving towards south he says the sun came up upon the left out of the sea came he and he shone bright 
this is also significant and you, I need you to remember it nature they are feeling bright they are feeling merry they are feeling happy nature is also shown bright the Sun is shining brightly uh, it's it's uh, in its natural fashion and then he says he went down to see on the right higher he says higher and higher every day till over the mast at noon and at noon what would happen that the Sun would come right above the mast mast is the central pole in the ship the mast to which the sails are attached you must have seen big ships there is a huge uh, pole in the center of the ship to which those piece sails which are the pieces of cloth they are attached to uh, control the wind to control the uh, movement of the ship uh, through wind direction so till noon at noon you know at 12 o'clock the Sun is always right in the center of the sky it is right above uh, uh, our heads so the mariner ancient mariner had come to this point uh, that the wedding guest interrupts him the wedding guest here beats his breast beating his breast is like this for he heard the loud bassoon bassoon is the sound the musical sound the sound of the musical instrument coming from the wedding hall maybe the doors had doors had opened and he could hear the music coming out so the wedding guest feels agitated he remembers that he has come to attend the wedding and he wants to at go back to the wedding so he beats his breast then Coleridge tells you what has happened what is happening in the wedding he says the bride had paced into the hall red as a rose is she nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy minstrelsy so the bride he says uh, has gone down the hall she's dressed up uh, in red and uh, as she passes by everybody nods their heads and they're all the merry music merry minstrelsy is playing so the wedding is in full swing the wedding guest he beat his breast yet he cannot choose but hear so you see although he is agitated again he beats his breast again he shows his agitation but he can't leave his place and thus pick on that ancient man the bright-eyed mariner okay so the mariner continues his story he is not uh, bothered uh, about the feelings of this wedding guest so he says and now the storm last came in the previous lines they had uh, just reached the equator and it was at the, po at the equator point that the Sun had come right above their heads it was in the it was right above them because the equator as I told you is the center of the earth so and I also told you that it is at the equator that you will see a change or a development in the plot or in the story so this is what happens now as the Sun comes right above them that is an indication that they have reached at noon time they reached the equator and now that they have reached the equator all of a sudden changes in nature occur and what is that change first of all he says there is a storm blast so a strong storm overtakes them and he was tyrannous and strong he struck with his overtaking wings and chased the south along so what does this strong a storm do first of all the storm is personified you will see because he's using the word he for it storm he was tyrannous and strong as if he's some some uh, somebody with um, with a soul he was tyrannous he was a tyrant he was cruel and he was 
strong. He struck and then he uses a metaphor. And the metaphor that he uses for you is that of a flying creature. The storm is like some flying creature which is huge. Because he says he struck with his overtaking wings. So this storm, it struck the ship with his, uh, uh, with his huge wings. And he followed them. Chased them means he followed them towards the south. So they were going slowly at their own pace towards their destination. But now their destination is not in their control. Now they are being forced in some direction by this storm. So the storm now takes them at a great speed towards the south. With sloping mass and dipping pro, as who pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe, and forward bends his head, the ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward I we fled. He says, under the effect of the storm, naturally the ship was moving fast and everything had turned, was downward turned. The mast, I told you the mast are the poles uh, which uh, uh, give, you know, so sort of, a sort of uh, restore balance of the ship. So the mast had sloped under the effect of the storm, the great winds. And the pro uh, is the pro is the is the front part of the ship. It was dipping in water, and they were being pursued. He says with yell and blow. So you see again the personified the storm, which is personified as a huge bird, as a living object. The words that Coleridge uses for it is are yelling, yelling. The storms don't yell, but words Coleridge tells us that. Uh, the storm followed us, followed the ship with yelling, with yelling sound, with yells and blow. Blow is the force and the power. Still treads the shadow of his foe. So he followed them as someone follows his enemy. And forward bends his head. The ship drove fast. Loud roared the blast and southward I we fled. So he says, so he's simply telling you that under the effect of this powerful, strong storm or blast, the blast of wind, the ship drives fastly. It drives fast uh, towards south. And now there came both mist and snow and suddenly what happened? They reached where they were supposed to reach. They reach the land of mist and snow. They reach a place where there is nothing else but mist. You would understand what is mist, I am sure. Mists, mist is. We find mists at very cold places and they are like uh, thick fog. These are vapors which are condensed and uh, uh, it is difficult to see through the mist sometimes as it gets denser and des denser. So they had entered the region of the snow and the cold, which is, uh, in fact they have reached the Arctic. They reached the South Pole. And it is here that their ship gets stuck now. So you see the nature, how nature is described. Everything was peaceful, the sun was bright, the sea was peaceful. But all of a sudden, the strong wind and the strong wind with destructive, forceful power, it, uh, and uncontrollable, with, uh, it is, has got uncontrollable power. It drives them towards a region, uh, towards a new land, a land again surrounded by nature, but this nature is again is uh, not warm. It is uh, it is literally and metaphorically cold. It does not give uh, 
um, any sense of uh, uh, compassion, life, or feeling of love. So, uh, because you will see that the sailors will feel frightened here. And Coleridge says, and it grew wondrous cold, and ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald. So he says, this place was really cold, they started shivering, and ice mast high. Ice, this uh, mast high, these are the icebergs. In the Arctic region, we find that icebergs, you know, icebergs are like mountains. They are like small hills. These are mountains of ice. They are not mountains of uh, stones. These are mountains of ice which float in the ocean. So, around their ship floated these mountains of ice, these icebergs, which were as high as their, the masts of their ship. So you can see how scary it is. Then they were floating around their ship, these icebergs, as green as emerald. And they were as green as emerald. Green maybe because of the clarity of water. The water was clean there, so all the weeds, the green weeds at the bottom, they all they get the they get reflected in the water. So the it, it appeared the water and the ice appeared to be green in shade but for them the picture was sailors for the failures the picture was scary and through the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen nor shapes of men nor bees we can the ice was all between see he tells you of the dismal picture. The picture is not that of, of a, hap, uh, a happy picture. It is dismal, he says. He says, we drifted through these snowy cliffs. The ship moved. Drifted means move. The ship moved through the close snowy cliffs. And all they got was a dismal shine, the reflection. Uh, naturally, uh, it uh, sometimes the eyes, our eyes also hurt when they, when we all that we see around us is white, white, white. The uh, icebergs, the white ice uh, around you, uh, above you, uh, beneath you. So they were the scene before them was dismal. It was depressing. It was sad. Nor shapes of men. Another sad thing was there was no sign of life. He says, no, no shapes of men or beasts we can, we saw. So there was no life in that region. No bees, no men. The ice was all between. What, wherever they saw, they saw ice. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swoon. This is what Coleridge emphasizes. In fact, it is the ancient mariner who is emphasizing. He says, we, went, we came to this strange place that what we saw around us was only ice. And now, first it was a storm that was personified. Now it is ice uh, which is personified. A metaphor, he uses a metaphor of an animal. The ice is compared to an animal, a breathing animal because he says it cracked the sounds that came out these only sounds that they could hear were the cracking of the ice which is normal but he says and growled as if you know it's a, it's a living animal which growls you know that dogs growl so growl is that something that comes from the depth of our throats and roared so, uh, if growling is a low, uh, at a low frequency, at a low pitch, roaring is at a higher frequency. And howl, howling is also at a higher, high frequency, a higher pitch. So, you see, he says, there, was, there are these all kinds of noises, and they are distracted, they are uh, troubled by these noises. But he says, they are all the sounds of the ice. 
and what is the how do they hear these noises he says like noises in a swoon swoon is as if in a in a dream swoon is in a, some kind of a dream in a dreamy state of mind he says we heard these these noises came to us as if we were in a some kind of a dream so this is a strange place that Coleridge takes you to and he shows you how nature can also be indifferent to the suffering of humans. It is not the nature that Wordsworth paints, it is a different kind of nature. So you see, it is uh, scary. And then see, they they are they have a blessing in the shape of a bird they had not come across any living thing uh, uh, when they had reached this place but he says at length did cross an albatross through the fog it came as if it had been a Christian soul we hailed it in God's name so after a long time, he says, there came an albatross. And now albatross, you may have seen some of these birds. An albatross is a, uh, it's a beautiful, huge bird. And it's a migrating bird. It migrates, uh, it can travel long distances. It travels between these cold places uh, to those tropical places and uh, it's a huge beautiful uh, bird it's a friendly bird to sailors also sailors uh, naturally on their journeys across seas they must com come across uh, a lot of these birds they feed on fish so after a long time as they got stuck in that place the ship is uh, stuck in the ice there is ice the water had uh, turned into ice in that cold region this remember there are icebergs there are uh, cliffs of ice which surround the ship so the ship is actually their ship is actually stuck it is stuck in the snow it is stuck in the ice and we cannot move all they hear is the sound of the ice so a change is going to occur now so there is a change now and this change comes with this object of nature which is the albatross so albatross or this bird is actually a sign of blessing for them because Coleridge tells you that it, it was a Christian soul he says it came to us as if it had been a Christian soul a Christian soul a pure soul we hailed it in God's name. This is important. It is important because they, uh, it shows that the sailors were praying to God. They were praying for help. And the help did come. Their prayers were answered. So they hailed it in God's name. They welcomed. Hail means to welcome. They welcomed the bird in God's name because they know that it was a blessing it ate the food it never had eat, ate and round and round it flew the eyes did split with a thunder fit the helmsman steered us through so now what is the effect of the albatross the effect of the albatross is that the eyes cracked the ship was stuck in the ice it could not move but uh, as the albatross was a sign of blessing was a sign of mercy for them the ice cracked out of uh, without any reason without any logic so again uh, some some supernatural happening occurring here but you see how he blends both the natural and the supernatural albatross is part of the natural world he's a bird so he's part of the natural world but uh, this cracking of the ice without any reason it is not a natural occurring it is a supernatural occurrence so how he blends the natural and the supernatural so the ice cracked open 
with a sound, with a loud sound. He says with a thunder fit. And the helmsman, the the uh, person on the driving seat, he steered. He moved the ship through the crack and took them out of that land of ice. And then now the ship is now free to move. Okay. And Coleridge also tells you, you see again he also blends the natural with the supernatural. He says the bird ate the food it never had eaten. So the bird was strange, he says. It was eating food with the sailors and according to Coleridge it ate the food which it had never eaten. So you see the natural is uh, blended in beautifully with the supernatural. And round the ship it, flo flowed, uh, it flew and flew. And then he says, and a good south wind sprung up behind, the albatross did follow, and every day for food or play came to the mariners hollow. And second effect, second blessing that this bird brought with it is in the uh, shape of south wind. So the wind also, you see wind is very important for sailors. You know that. Because if there's no wind, the ship can hardly move. It, uh, in those times, these ships were not uh, propelled by an engine, uh, uh, like the Titanic or the modern ships now. But uh, these uh, ships were dependent upon the wind. So he says now, s the wind sprung up. From the south, the wind came. So this, w this wind that came from the south, it pushed them towards up, pushed them up towards north. The albatross followed them, it did not leave them, and every day for food or for play it would come to the uh, mariners, to these uh, shipmen. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine, whilst all the night through fog smoke white, glimmered the white moonshine. In these lines are also important. Here Coleridge describes to you the nature, how nature looked at that time. He says, whether it was mist, there was mist, or there was cloud, or sometimes it, the word sat on the mast, sometimes on the shroud, which is a cloth, but it stayed with the ship, he says, for Vespers 9. Vespers 9 meaning 9 days and 9 nights. And all the nights, these nights, he says, through fog smoke white. So they are still in the cold region, although they have left the Arctic, Arctic, but they are, they are still in that uh, the region of cold. So the, uh, there is a ship is still surrounded by fog. Fog has not left them. But through the fog smoke, through the fog, he says, glimmered the my white moonshine. The moon is white. This is another, I have highlighted it for you. Um, uh, the nights, uh, although there is fog, but the night is also, is, is the nights are peaceful and it, the white, there is the white moonlight, which is naturally a blessing. Now we come to the last part of this part one. And Coleridge tells us what a uh, strange thing that this ancient mariner does. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why lookest thou so? Now these words are spoken by the sailors they see that the ancient mariner is looking strange, is looking troubled. Plague means to, you know, that someone, as if something is bothering him, troubling him. So he says, why does it look that something is bothering you? Why do you look as if something is uh, troubling you? Why do you look so sad? He says, God save the ancient mariner. Why do you look so troubled? Why do you look so sad? Why do you look so uh, down? And the answer that he gives them is, with my crossbow, I shot the albatross. And without any reason, 
without uh, uh, the bird having offended them in some manner and knowing very well that it was because of the bird that they have they are now out of trouble and also in the knowledge that they had first welcomed the bird as a blessing from God he commits a sin so from here different themes are going to emerge one is the theme of sin and redemption so that sin is now committed without a reason the ancient mariner killed the albatross he killed the bird he killed it with his crossbow with the arrow and the bird came down and fell into their ship so the bird is killed now the bird which was their friend the bird which was a sign of blessing and mercy for them the bird which was a sign of nature which was part of the natural world is now dead but you have to remember that the bird is part of the natural world but the way the bird came to their help and uh, how uh, the help was uh, given to them that was all in, an, in a supernatural manner the bird appeared out of nowhere through fog it came and then when it appeared the ice cracked that is all supernatural phenomena so it is part of the natural world at the same time it is part of the supernatural world so cold, ancient mariner in killing this bird has committed a sin on both the natural and the supernatural world and now from the next part we will see that uh, Coleridge tells us how both the natural and the supernatural world they are going to take revenge from ancient mariner but they are also going to take revenge uh, on all the sailor, sailors because Coleridge is later going to tell us they were all accomplices in his crime so no, no one will be spared and since the next part is important uh, it deals with different themes and different themes are introduced in the poem uh, one of them is that of sin and redemption and uh, uh, I'm going to start with the next part in the next uh, lecture and maybe we will do uh, two parts in the next lecture so up till here we had uh, what uh, what we can call the introduction to the story and we have come up till that point where a sin is committed the sin is committed because there was no reason for that act it is a sin because um, it is an act against uh, a peaceful it is an, it was an act against uh, an innocent soul the albatross remember uh, Coleridge described it as a Christian soul it was a pure innocent soul so it symbolized the albatross symbolized purity and uh, a, a, a spirituality so uh, the killing of the bird is uh, synonymous with the killing of an innocent soul and that is why it is a sin it is a sin it is a crime uh, against nature it is a crime against uh, super, the supernatural world as Coleridge will tell you and as a result we shall see that the spiritual supernatural and the natural all these words they are going to take their revenge from them and they will all be punished and they will all be penalized and they will all have to pay for what they have done so with this uh, I come to the end of the lecture and uh, as I said I'm going to begin with the next part in the next class with a brief recap so I will uh, meet you again in the next lecture 
Thank you very much.